So when you were uh, when you were working if, if for the agency, what were, were some of like the most common cases you were working on with people, whether it be case officers or whether it be like recruited agents? What what were, what were some of the common like issues, psychological no. issues, or well, in those in those first years when I was in that particular unit, it was mainly uh, people of interest related to higher levels of government. Um, right, right. And then I I moved to the um, sort of what people call the Q branch or the director of science and technology and mm. mainly worked in uh, in the office of the chief scientist on our detecting deception program. And so most of my detecting work- Detecting well, deception program? Yeah. So most of my, uh, most of my work in the, the last five years I was there was really looking at this question of how accurate are any of these methodologies that purport to be successful at detecting deception and how do we know they work and at the time the more i investigated it with my team and we created we set up different labs and i was in charge of um reviewing the protocols that the government would fund to say show us if this technology works right and so my job was to go to the sites because i've done a lot of human studies and we'd be able to see is is the study valid does the tech work and things like that and the long and short of it was most of what was being advertised doesn't really work that well at all um whether it's a voice stress analyzer or uh, a traditional version of the polygraph or brain scans uh, where everybody wants your tax dollars, right? They want the government to buy their products to go and use Contractors. Them. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if you heard of the PCAS, that portable uh, credibility assessment, it's supposed to be a handheld no. little polygraph. They cost a lot and they never Like worked. an e-meter type thing? It almost like looks like- Scientology like, It thing? almost looks like an e-meter. Okay. Yeah, it has uh, a red light, a green light, and a yellow wow. light. And it was supposed to um, sort of streamline this idea, but it's linked to the same idea as the polygraph, right? That lying makes you alarmed and that by using any technology that sees an activation of your fear and alarm system, that must mean you're lying. And I'm like, well, I think the premise is flawed because if you're in a war zone and you want to come and tell the U.S. something, and you know that other people will kill you for telling us something, you're going to be more nervous than the person who goes, I think I'll go tell them a story, see if they give me some money. Mm -hmm. So the, the lies in the intelligence world are more along the lines of lies of fabrication. Like, I know something you should know, so pay me, and I'll, and I'll tell you, mm -hmm. which is different than the common lies that police run into, which is, I don't know, I wasn't there and I didn't do it. Right when they right. go, were, were you involved in a crime? Sure. No. So mm -hmm. we call that a lie of omission. Um, and most of the studies that existed at the time, everything was centered around that law enforcement model of mm -hmm. police interviewing somebody and saying you did it. And went, right. No, I didn't do it. Um, and the thinking around that—it's like more of an offensive versus defensive lie. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And it was like just think. I mean, the guy who created the polygraph, right? And you think about that, and think about Wonder Woman. He created Wonder Woman as well, right? <laughs> so that's why her lasso—you know, she could wrap it around people, make them tell the truth. <laughs> that was the fantasy or like truth serum. But the hypothesis was that lying is a threat, and so when you go to lie, it activates your sympathetic nervous system because you're trying to you're trying to survive yeah. the threat. And that if we detect activations of that part of your brain or your body, that's why it measures your blood pressure, your heart rate, your skin conductance, that those will tell us that you're lying. In fact, it's not- Proxies, uh, it's measuring proxies. They're proxies for it. <clears throat> and, in, and it's not really that great. Mm -hmm. I mean, the meta-analyses and looking at the accuracy of the polygraph suggest maybe comes in around 52 to 56%. You know, you could flip a coin. Under certain circumstances, there is a form of the polygraph testing called guilty knowledge testing where you can get it up to about 70, 75%, uh, but it's a recognition thing. So for example, if I have you look at a card, I say here we've got seven playing cards or seven numbers, you, you look at one, shuffle them up, mm -hmm. and then I just hold it up and you just say no, and I go, was it this number? Was it this number? Was it this number? You could say yes or no. When you see the number you saw before, you'll have a recognition waveform in your head. You get a, you get a P300, sure. an orienting sort of response to it, and that'll change your skin conductance. And so, but you could say yes to them all too. So it's not really a lie test. It's a test of recognition. Sure. But that's not the test that people use in the when they're 
interviewing people in the field and saying, you know, have you ever lied? Have you ever done this? Is today Tuesday? Are you sitting down? So part of my part of my program was looking at those different kinds of polygraph testing mm -hmm. and then looking at new technology. Some people wanted us to fund brain imaging stuff to go to Afghanistan. I was like, who's going to put their head in a magnet and lay still? <laughs> so, right. you know, it's really true if you have a if you have a compliant participant who goes, I promise not to hum, wiggle, do anything. Right. Just think about what you tell me to think about or push the little buttons when you tell me. Right. You can see some really nice differences in brain scanning uh, between when someone is saying no, that they don't know something or don't recognize something or endorsing a story that's a lie versus a story that's the truth. Mm -hmm. But um, a friend of mine did a study for uh, Jerry Gannis uh, up at Harvard, and he found that if you just think about wiggling your little finger, you don't when you're in the scanner, but just think about it. It made the differences go away. So uh, it made the differences go. It made the oh. differences in in brain activity that were that were seen between when you were lying or truth telling. You could obliterate those differences by just imagining you were wiggling your little finger. Oh so, wow! So this dream that you know we could take you, force you to put your head in a yeah. in an fMRI mm -hmm. or something, and say, "Tell us the truth." You know, and you go no, <laughs> and it wow. would, you know, it. So it was sort of a fantasy. Um, most people, most people didn't understand that, and so my job, I got to be known as Doctor No, <laughs> Doctor No, <laughs> you know, because I would look at proposals and I would say, no. How many proposals did you look at? How much okay. was there? A lot of spooky technology that they tried to test out. Oh, every, people want the government's money, right? Oh yeah. Or, yeah, we looked at hundreds. allegedly. <laughs> yes. How, <laughs> looked at tons of proposals and most of the time we had to think about look our our budget wasn't you know unlimited and you're talking so, about budget you're talking about cia budget specifically yeah, okay in in science and tech we had you know with my boss we had a particular budget that could be devoted to it so we would say how do we want to spend taxpayer money on saying what would be really useful what would be relevant for that so that was a lot of fun because mm -hmm. that part of my job was Delightful. I got to meet lots of scientists, listen to their ideas, help them figure out will it work, won't it work, look at the results and say, looks interesting, probably won't help people in the real world mm. for that. But there were a couple of technologies that um, turned out to work that were really useful. So, And we've published on those since 2000, I think the first one was in... 2006, 2007, 2008. Yeah, I saw that you've published like over 100 peer-reviewed papers on this stuff. Yeah, that's how I've uh, spent my youth. <laughs> <laughs> I've designed all my studies on a bar napkin, you know, while, while drinking and talking to colleagues. Uh, wow. It's when you get most playful mm. and you can design things. But no, I've been fortunate. I never thought I would be publishing on um, on detecting deception, though, because my thing was stress, PTSD. Mm -hmm. Right. But when I was there, it turned out, I thought, well, this is how I can be the most useful, even if you can tell people what doesn't work. Yeah. It's helpful, right? Right. Totally. I, mean, I remember sitting in one meeting, I forgot where it was, we were over at the National Science Foundation, but I remember somebody presented on some data that was basically showing that their toy worked 33% uh, of the time. And and I remember looking at the guy next to me, I'm like, flip a penny, you'll, you'll at least get to 50. <laughs> and, and I remember, I had two special agents sitting in the row who went, no, doc, but, you know, 33% is better than nothing. Right. And I'm like, no, it's not better than nothing. Mm. A penny is better than nothing. Just yeah. Further. So people have a, they really have a misconception about chance, human judgment. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I've yeah. heard statistics like about the um, the old Stargate program that they used to do, the, whole, the old re Cold War remote viewing type stuff. Yeah. Where they, I think, I could be wrong, but if I read it correctly, if I remember correctly, it was like, less than 10% or something accuracy, but they still dumped millions of dollars into it. Oh yeah. I don't know if it's ever been proven. No, but it's it's entirely <clears throat> compelling at a personal level because you remember the times you got a hit. Right. right? It's like gambling. You right. Know, you don't remember all the times you lost, but if you win once, you go, well, that paid off. That was mm. really good. So we have a tendency to disregard when something didn't work and we remember when it did. Mm -hmm. So if somebody uses, whether it's a voice stress analyzer or a polygraph or something, they go, well, I know it works because that one time we caught a guy. And I go, right. yeah, but you don't know how many times you missed like the 10 that got away. Mm -hmm. So to calculate accuracy, I have to know the true positive rate, how many hits we really got, 
and I need to know the true negative and the false negative rate of something. Mm -hmm. I need to know how many people I cleared that were truly innocent and that I wasn't just clearing people who got away with their lies. Yeah. So what happens in real life is practitioners, whether they're an investigator or something, they don't know who lied and fooled them and got away because they cleared them. They went, well, I believe him, so he's good, right? Sure. So all they're left with in right. their mind are the people who finally confessed and looked like the confession matched what happened. And so it can reinforce this, this belief and before it sounds too disparaging of those guys, I'll, we'll pick on doctors. Mm -hmm. Doctors do the same thing. That's just why now we have to do double-blind studies for medication. Because every doctor could say, well, I gave that pill to my patient and they got better. Right. Right? Well, and yeah. And the same thing with surgeries, too. Like, yeah. lots of doctors, they do surgeries. And the, the surgeries that are... There's a, I'm sure there's a vast majority of them where they never hear from that patient ever again. So they don't know right. if it went right or if it went right. wrong and if they found another surgeon. Correct. To, you know? Right. So that's that, that's that selection <laughs> bias of information that happens. Mm -hmm. And so from a personal level, you can come away intensely convinced something really works. Uh, it's just that we're not aware of all the times it didn't, which if we knew that, it would correct our, it would correct our view. But... Uh, it's so like I always tell people, you know, you remember every time you hear the report of an airplane crash, but right? Your, but your watch doesn't beep every second a plane lands safely yes. somewhere on the planet, right? Because yes. it would drive you nuts. Mm -hmm. But you go, yeah, but that one time, right? Right. Yeah. So that's how our brains are wired. We we give disproportionate emphasis on something that's that is meaningful to us, mm. and we 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 place a different value on it. And that's true in the detecting deception stuff. Uh, I mean, I thought the funny part in in that whole world is we as human beings, we always believe we're better at detecting deception than we are. Mm -hmm. And when someone's lying, they always believe that you can see more of their lie than you really can. Mm. So there's that illusion of transparency and that illusion of omniscience, right? And so you got two people being interviewed. The interviewer who's like, I think I can detect deception. And you got the guilty person going, I think they see more of my lie. And both are wrong. So, you know. Thank <laughs> you.